Critical Role Campaign 3 has finally passed the 50 episode mark, the strange ruinous arc seemingly finally coming to a head as our band of heroes look to try to foil the plans of some scary big baddies. But you see, for a variety of reasons, much of the fan base seems to have some kind of a problem or an issue with this story in Critical Role Campaign 3, as it seems like at least once a week, there's a Reddit post or Twitter post like this one where frustrated fans share their feelings on Critical Role's third campaign. So just what is going on with campaign three? And is it really that disappointing? So as many of you know, Critical Role began as a live stream Dungeons and Dragons campaign featuring a bunch of nerdy ass voice actors who happen to be friends. And yeah, the rest is really history. Episode 1 of Campaign 1 of Critical Role aired on March 12, 2015. The show would run as a live broadcast for around 5 years all the way up until July 2nd, 2020. In the 100th episode of Critical Role Campaign 2, where the cast would be forced to shift their broadcast to a pre-recorded episode, released at the usual time due to, well, the massive pandemic that shook the world at the time. After seeing out the rest of Campaign 2 in this way, the cast decided to stick with this pre-recorded format post-COVID restrictions as they believed that this would help them function more normally in their day-to-day -day lives. For example, now that the episodes are pre-recorded, the cast don't need to feel pressured at arriving to the studio on time, or even early for the live broadcast of the show. Fans of Campaign 1 will know that this was somewhat of a consistent problem with the original live format oftentimes forcing cast members to show up late to the broadcast, seeing as, you know, they have other jobs and responsibilities outside of this D&D game, at least they did at the time. According to Matt and Maresha in an interview they did leading up to the release of Campaign 3, the show being pre-recorded allows the cast and the crew members to spend more times with their family. In addition, shifting to a pre-recorded format removes much of the stress that comes in making a live broadcast. Obviously, when things are live, they're live, so any tech errors or delays will immediately impact the broadcast, potentially causing delays and stress for issues that must be fixed on the spot and in a timely manner. Switching to pre-recorded removes basically most of these stressors, as the new potential broadcast and recording issues can be handled more thoroughly and with less stress in a more timely manner. On the surface, the Critical Role team switch to a pre-recorded format seems like a good one, basically for all parties involved. But part of the fandom really didn't see it this way. You see, over the years, Critical Role has undoubtedly changed in many ways outside of just this switch to pre-recorded format. As the show blew up in popularity, the level of professionalism in the broadcast increased as well. New fancy sets were made, cameras and audio tech were upgraded. Overall, the broadcast had a much more professional feel, which certain fans in the audience began to take note of. When looking and examining the criticism over this shift to the pre-recorded broadcast, it's kind of hard to identify exactly what the issues are that the community is clambering about. Many of these complaints seem to have a familiar sentiment to them. Basically, that critical role has changed. It doesn't feel the same as it once did, especially compared to Campaign 1 or even Campaign 2, or really even for the first two-thirds of Campaign 3. Now, I think that this is a perfectly okay feeling and sentiment to have. Critical Role has in fact changed. Changed in many ways over the years. And we know, well, we know how people feel about change. The reality is this, Critical Role never really interacted with their live audience really all that much to begin with. Most of the interaction itself came in the early days of Campaign 1, and it really just came in the forms of the players reading chat, oftentimes during the live game. Over time, it seemed like this really began to cause a few problems, as there were a number of smaller incidents where cast members were inadvertently receive information that they shouldn't know or didn't figure out through the chat, as well access to a live chat constantly uh, giving you feedback, most of it negative at times. Yeah, I definitely understand why Critical Role would move to a pre-recorded broadcast and get away from some of the toxic elements that come from a live Twitch broadcast. In reality, I do think that many of these complaints from the fandom uh, about the nature of the pre-recorded nature of the show are misplaced. 
as to me, it really didn't seem like it impacted the show and the nature of the show, the feeling of the show all that much. But if that's the case, then why is there such a vocal part of the fan base that seems to dislike and be disillusioned with Campaign 3 of Critical Role? Critical Role has come a long, long way. What initially started as a wholesome group of nerdy-ass voice actors playing Dungeons & Dragons has quickly grown to a multi-million dollar media company. The Critical Role team is frankly busier than ever, producing a variety of shows and different types of content and media outside of the Critical Role broadcast. Manufacturing merchandise, arranging sponsorship deals, producing books and graphic novels. Hell, they even have their own massively successful animated series. No. Change? Change was just inevitable, wasn't it? You see, the reality is this. Critical Role has managed to strike gold twice, producing two compelling D&D campaigns, both very different with deep and lovable characters, all rolled up in an epic story and an epic world. In really many ways, every time they start a new campaign, they're essentially taking another risk. They're playing new characters and telling a new story. But the fact is that every fan will necessarily compare the newest campaign and its newest characters and its newest party dynamic to their favorite moments of older campaigns. It's human nature, dude. Fans fall in love with one set of characters, their dynamics, and their stories. So of course they're gonna be a bit upset when they feel that they can't connect to a new story or a new set of characters like they could the old one. As much as there is a minority of the fan base that beats their chest declaring that this switch to a pre-recorded broadcast is killing Critical Role, the reality is they just connect with the story differently. Last year I put out a video called Campaign 3 Has a Problem. In this video I discussed what I believe to be the main issues that Campaign 3 has faced up until that point. This problem was, well, pacing. The first, like, 20 episodes of Campaign 3 at times felt so disjointed and really slow. The first arc of the party almost feeling like a fever dream when you compare it to the broad story of Campaign 3 now that we're over 50 episodes in. A lot of this just comes with the fact, I think, that the Critical Role team were trying a new approach. Several of the characters in our party are reoccurring characters from a miniseries, a first in Critical Role history. As well, Campaign 3 began with a guest character in the party, played by Robbie Draymond. This immediately caused a small divide in the fanbase, Robbie eventually winning over the majority of them, which made his character's departure from the group as a whole all the more painful. As really in a lot of ways, Robbie's character Dorian was kind of the glue which felt like held this dysfunctional party together. Combine this with Critical Role's new break policy where they take the final week of the month off from a Critical Role broadcast, as well they had several hiatuses throughout Campaign 3 for different miniseries such as EXU Calamity, Exandria Unlimited Kaimo, and The Return of the Mighty Nine, and you can see why fans might feel a bit disconnected at the inconsistent pace of said story. Largely though, to me, it seems like a majority of the complaints for Campaign 3 come from a lack of connection with the characters and the story itself. One of the things to me that made Campaign 2 so good, in my opinion, was the immersion into the world of Wildmount. All of our characters were intrinsically linked in different ways to the different areas of said world, meaning that they as characters could impact the world around them and that they themselves would be impacted by plot development in a deeper way as it's happening in an area of the world that they are intrinsically linked in. This also allows characters to shine just way, way brighter because they were linked to different areas, like we said, of the world, so they could take the load off and the reins from Matt Mercer in terms of storytelling and world building and narrative functions. For example, when the cast travel to the Dwindalian Empire, it is Bo and Caleb that take the lead. When they move down to the uh, Lucidian Ocean and the Lucidian Coast, it is Ford and Jester who 
take the reins and the control kind of of the story and the party. We move on up into Jorhas, and now it's Yasha's time. Overall, it just felt like we, the audience, were more bought in and invested into kind of the story of Campaign 3, when it feels like the events in the world more directly impact the characters. Now, if you've made it this far into the video, I suppose I should say that while I have critiqued many aspects of Critical Role Campaign 3, and I admit that the first 20, even 30 episodes were rough at times, the story oftentimes feeling like it was grinding to a complete halt, or the characters just feeling sorely out of place in their motivations in the world and the story that was being told, at the time. Over time, though, many of these issues have largely faded away as the story began to develop before us. Campaign 3, in many ways, is Matt Mercer's brainchild and his most ambitious project to date. With the greater story and narrative challenges that our cast and characters are facing seemingly in development in Matt's mind, really since the beginning of Critical Role all of those years ago. Remember how I mentioned earlier that Campaign 3 had kind of a real annoying pacing problem? This was partly due to pauses in the story that took place, like we said, so the Critical Role team could debut their other media projects like the Exandria Unlimited series. But you see, this was all done intentionally from the start, from the very beginning. What originally just seemed like some fun extra side mini-series content introducing new characters and their stories into the world of Exandria was actually a way for Matt to set the stage for the greater narrative, the greater story in Campaign 3. You see, Bell's Hells in Campaign 3 are currently facing a potential world-ending event and problem as the mysteries of the Red Moon of Ruidus begin to reveal themselves throughout the story to us. We begin to put the pieces together of the puzzle that were expertly left by Matt Mercer. In many ways, Campaign 3 is the culmination of all of the stories in the Critical Role universe to date, all of the stories of Critical Role combined. We need to remember that this is a living, breathing world where our characters' actions and choices throughout the campaigns have left a significant impact on just how the world functions today in Critical Role Campaign 3 and the many challenges that will face our party. A year ago, at the time, I was slightly annoyed at the breaks that Critical Role was taking for the Examandria Unlimited series, even though EXU Calamity, I gotta say, is easily one of the best pieces of D&D media that Critical Role has ever done. But you see, when you take a step back and examine and ask yourself, just why would the Critical Role team decide to do this, it all begins to fall into place. It all begins to make sense. EXU Calamity tells the story of the beginning of the Calamity, a great war between the gods that took place far in the past world of Exandria. But the world itself today in the story is still reeling from the effects of said war. EXU Calamity wasn't just a fun side story, an insane prequel series where we got to witness the brilliance of Brendan Lee Mulligan at the Critical Role table. No, if we dive a little deeper, we begin to see just how some of the more important elements and themes and information that were presented to, to us, the audience, that we learned during EXU Calamity, for example, such as the nature of the Apogee Solstice, is deeply linked to the issues facing our party and players in Campaign 3. It was all planned masterfully from the beginning. Yes, there are definitely issues with Campaign 3. Like I said, the first 20 to 30 episodes at times can feel like a real slog. At first, many of our characters feel kind of weird and out of place in the world, as there doesn't really seem to be a whole lot that links them and ties them to this region of Marquette, let alone the first few challenges that they face. But slowly over time, as the story begins to unfold, Matt begins peeling back layer after layer, slowly revealing the interconnectedness of the whole entire story and of the characters and really the entire world and the history of Exandria as a whole. Is this party dynamic the easiest to understand. No. Are all of the characters as deeply fleshed out as I would like them to be? 
No. Even still, over time though, I have fallen in love with the characters of Critical Role Campaign 3 and their interpersonal dynamic and relationship, stories and connections to the world, as in my opinion, this set of characters has some of the most interesting and compelling and dynamic backstories of any Critical Role cast characters today. Campaign 3 isn't bad, it's just different. Critical Role as a whole really is just different in many ways than it was when it began. And that's okay. Yes, Campaign 3 has some issues. Yes, it starts off pretty slow, but to me, the payoff that we are getting well over a year and a half into our story is so worth it. When you're able to take a step back and really appreciate the scope of the story that Matt is trying to tell here. Like we've said, Campaign 3 in many ways is the culmination of over eight years of storytelling in the Critical Role world and massive world building that has taken place in Critical Role up until this point. It's a story eight years in the making that has been meticulously thought out and shaped throughout the choices that were made in previous Critical Role games. It's not perfect, far from it. Campaign 3 is a campaign for the diehards, a campaign for those of us who have been here since the beginning. A campaign for those of us who meticulously eat up every shred of critical role lore and mystery that is presented to us. At the end of the day, it's impossible to please everyone. Every media series that becomes successful eventually has to deal with that problem. Audiences don't like change, no matter how large or small that the change in reality really is. Yes, most of the backlash for Campaign 3 has come from a small minority of very vocal and upset fans. Who would have guessed it? And while many of their complaints are valid, Critical Role is going to continue to grow and change regardless of what these people think. While many aspects about the show have changed, from its production value to its switch to being pre-recorded, to me, the driving factor that keeps me coming back to Critical Role hasn't changed. It still feels like that same group of goofy yet talented friends meeting up and telling a deep, compelling, interesting story together. It's still every bit as silly as it always was, while simultaneously though, it's deep and emotional and tells these really raw human stories in a way that really only a Dungeons & Dragons game can do. If you're someone who gave up on Campaign 3 early, I highly, highly encourage you to give it another shot. Just make liberal use of that 1.5 speed button or hell, even skip a few episodes. From my point of view, it's completely worth it, as this story has taken off in a massive, massive way over the last 10 to 15 episodes. And to me, it really feels like things are starting to hit their stride in Critical Role Campaign 3. It's impossible to know what direction Critical Role is going to take in the future. And while I know that I'm not going to like everything that they do, every type of content that they put out, as long as Critical Role doesn't change what fundamentally made it so good, that blend of real-life friendships and personal relationships combined with amazing acting and storytelling and world-building, I'll still be here watching this show and immersing myself in the world of Exandria, and I really hope that you will join me. As always, guys, if you enjoyed the video or learned something new, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe as it really does help my channel grow and it really does help me out. Why don't you go check out some of our other Critical Role content, like our full review and analysis on why you should watch Legend of Vox Machina and how Legend of Vox Machina is changing the game for animation. As always, guys, I hope to see you in the next one. Stay safe out there. Is it Thursday yet? As always, peace, love, adieu. Story that might be, we wasn't supposed to happen. So much talk around us, we became numb to the yapping. It was like 05, got my license to drive. Picked you up in my pops car, went for a ride. Couldn't no one tell us nothing. That night was ours, all the stars aligned, and you were so damn fine. Yeah.